So we were working on the Friedberg spinning theorem, and, and we noticed that uh, in this Friedberg spinning, in, in the uh, construction, I guess we get the whole, the whole construction, but not yet the, the, the tech that the construction works. But in this construction, the the big worry was about uh, if you have some different computably enumerable phenomena, we had this set B, which was enumerated by a function f, and we had arbitrary sets W, E, and, and we were worried that uh, if you write down the, the, the requirements as we had, that, that things might always appear too late in WE, right, in the ETH uh, computably enumerable set. It, 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 this was the big worry, that, that uh, our enumeration of the computably enumerable set B was so slow that uh, all of the WE or, or even that a, a single WE was, was too quick for it and, 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 and wouldn't be dealt with in the right way. Maybe it's the other way around. I forget. It was the other way around. All the elements that you want to check for are too far down the list. Uh, exactly. Right? They, they need to appear early enough because, because we had a nice computable condition which you can check. And, and, and okay, so, so that's what we need to, to deal with first. And after we've dealt with that, we'll, we'll get back to Friedberg's spreading theorem and, and see that we've now solved it. Uh, so, the first thing to look at is uh, sort of a, a general, more general view than we need, but, but um, we'll uh, uh, develop the, the, the general view for a little bit. So, so if I have this, sort of a, a sequence of computably enumerable sets, then this sequence of computably enumerable sets could be terribly complicated because it could be that uh, right, V of E is non-empty exactly if E is in the holding problem or, or uh, even much more complicated problems, right? Completely uh, way too complicated. So, so an arbitrary sequence of computably enumerable sets could contain in it way too much information. Uh, and so we, we have um, the abbreviation of a uniform computably enumerable set, sequence of sets, which is a, a, computably, a sequence of computably enumerable sets that does not contain this additional information inside of the indices. Uh, and, and that is exactly given by a function f, which is computable such that V is W F of E. So you have uh, all of the indices, the index for the E set is, is computably obtained from E, which is a very nice uh, enumeration. If you have such a uniformly computably enumerable set, sequence of sets, then from this you can obtain an H which is 1-1 one, one, uh, computable, uh, is that all? Yes, such that H of omega is equal to um, x e, where x is in v e. So, so H is not an enumeration of uh, one of the sets in this CE set, but it's a, it's an enumeration of all of them, and, and whenever it outputs an X, it includes with it an index in, into which of the set it goes, which of these sets it goes. Now, of course, you're a little bit concerned about something. So it's computable? Yes. So, so how do you go from this to that? Uh, did I claim this already? I should have claimed this. Given such a uniformly computable enumerable sequence of sets, you want to have such an H. You can 
most of the time. This one we said needs to be infinite. All of them together need to be right. infinite. Right? The, the, okay. the union of all the V of V should be infinite, otherwise you could never achieve the one oneness. Yeah. But of course this is uh, the same with the theorem for, for a given computably enumerable set. We had this whole variety of characterization theorems which says, well, if it's non-empty, then you're the range of a total function. But if you're infinite, then the, you're the range of a one-one total function. And so this equivalence is an equivalence under the same restrictions that uh, uh, you can just get a computable function as soon as not all of them are empty. Uh, and you can get a one-one function if the union of all of them uh, is infinite. And then these two things really are uh, equivalent. Right? Given such an H, you, you can obtain such an F from it. Um, right? For any given uniformly computable enumerable, uniformly computable enumerable, for any UCE, uh, there's many Fs that work, right? There's many Fs that work. And, Okay, so this shows that these are nice definitions of sequences of CE sets. Uh, with this, then, we can define uh, VES, and, and this looks a, a little bit familiar, of course. There's, there's, there's the, the, the comma S, where the comma S always meant intuitively S computed in at most S steps, and, and then we noticed with some exercises that you need to be a little careful exactly how you define it. Well, he, here comes an exact definition of this V as uh, the set of X such that there exists a T less than or equal to S such that H of T is equal to uh, X E. Right? You look at the first S things that H outputs, uh, and you collect all those things together where H says they should be in E, and, and that's exactly what you get. Now you notice also that, that one of the things you get from this one oneness is that if you go from S to S plus 1, there is exactly one new candidate for, for all of the VE. So our, our, uh, the, the, stumbling block we had before with one of the exercises we worked on where, where too many things converged at the same time if you consider the S really a number of steps in the computation are, are nicely avoided here as well. Um, so in particular of course uh, we can talk about WES uh, if, if you're looking at the universal, uniformly computably enumerable sequence of sets consisting of all CE sets where, where F is the identity function, then you have a nice uh, computably enumerable set, therefore you get these WES out of it and, and, uh, and these WES now indeed according to this definition, have the property that at any stage at most one new point appears. Uh, even at any stage at most one new point appears in any of the CE uh, sets. And we can add to this the convention that if X is in WES, then uh, we want uh, both X and E to be less than S, which um, organize things in this sort of nice way. Okay, so given that, we can uh, talk about the, the or, or we, can get, we can go to the theorem that actually tells us something about the order of enumerations. Um, but first, two definitions. If I have uh, computable approximations xs to x, right, 
like W E as to W E. So if I have such an approximation for a C E Z X and, and I have a similar approximation like this for a C E Z Y, right? All of the X S and Y S are finite computable sets and, and uh, X S plus one is greater or equal to X S so it, the same things we got here from our definition, we assume here in, in the uh, part of the choice of these approximations, then we can make two definitions. One is uh, x minus y, which is a little bit confusing notation because it looks like the set difference between the two, which is which it's definitely not. This is the set of those z such that there exists uh, an s such that z is in xs but not in ys. Right? This, this minus is the usual notation, is, is such difference. <laughs> this backslash is uh, well, defined in this equation. And, and, and so x backslash y is exactly this, the set of those natural numbers that first appear in x. Maybe later in y, we don't care about that, that's perfectly allowed. If they first appear in x and then later in y, then you're still in this difference. But uh, uh, what really matters is that they appear in x before, if ever, in y. That, that is what this definition is. And then we have x down arrow y, or I guess it's not down arrow, it's the uh, southeast arrow. X southeast arrow y is all the things that appear in X before, if ever, they appear in Y that also appear in Y. So X southeast arrow y <coughs> uh, is exactly those things that first appear in X and then later in Y. And now you can see that this is related, very much related to the problem we were having in our Friedberg's Friedling theorem proof because we, we needed an order of enumeration to happen so we need to say something about this type of set in order to show that these requirements are appropriately satisfied uh, and what do we need to see about it? Uh, well what we need to see is that if we have a B which is computably enumerable Not computable, uh, and so, so so b b is equal to w little b just to to choose an index as well, um, and we have a computably enumerable set that contains b complement. Um, uh, then uh, we down arrow b is infinite. Right? We know from the assumption if c e not computable, therefore the complement is not computably enumerable. Therefore, if the complement is contained in the computably enumerable set, then there are things in w e which are also in b. How many things? Infinitely many, right? Clearly I'm going to say there's infinitely many with more properties, but there are certainly infinitely many things in WE that are also in B, because if the difference was finite, right, if you have a finite CE, if you have a CE set, any finite modification of a CE set is still CE. So, 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 this difference here, the difference between WE and, 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 and B complement is infinite, so there are at least infinitely many things which are both in WE and B. Which is what we had before too, but just like before, we, we don't just want to know that there are infinitely many, but that there are infinitely many that first appear in WE and then at some later point appear in B. That's what we need. Um, 
Okay. So let me prove this. Everybody happy with the theorem? Question like, so what what machine you like? What little b is here? B is the the, the code for a machine whose domain is b. No, I mean my question is like I guess depending on our choice of little b, um, that'll change the elements maybe of. Oh, absolutely, that, but that's exactly why why I, I, I wrote this now as part of the theorem. Okay. Well, I guess you could just. It doesn't matter which little b you pick. For every little b, okay. this set will be infinite. Uh, but it might be a different infinite set. Uh, and different enumerations of a CE sets can have wildly different orders. Uh, I've never considered how much this set is stable or not under these changes, but I suspect it's not very stable at all. Okay. So W E minus b I, I said minus but of course I didn't mean minus I meant this backslash notation things that first appear in WEE and then maybe if ever in b later uh, this is the same as those things which first appear in WEE and then definitely uh, in b Union but when when I when I wrote this down it seems perfectly reasonable. No, that's not the <laughs> when I wrote it down. Yesterday, when I wrote my notes, this statement seemed perfectly reasonable. But now I'm a little less convinced. Uh, oh, no, uh, yes, this is not a, a set subtraction. It, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is the, the, the computability theory of notation, right? Uh, 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 and then it, it does make sense. So the things which appear first in WE and then maybe eventually in B bar. Well, we know that WE contains all of B complement. Uh, so certainly, this set contains all of B complement. Uh, what else does it contain? Well, those things that first appear in WE and do end up in B. And, and that's exactly that. So, yes, as long as you don't make the natural mistake of reading this in, in a satirist way, this equation is good, right? Are you all with me? It's where you get. I, I remember submitting this article, and, and uh, the referee report came back saying it was on computability theory. The referee report came back saying uh, it appears one of the authors is a set theorist. And it shows in the notation, please change the following things so that the readership can understand what you're saying. Uh, and so this happens now the other way around. This is computability theorist notation, which um, confuses a theorist. Anyway, now we're all on the same page. So, so this set uh, falls apart into these two sets. If now... W E arrow B e is finite. Then we have a problem. This is this is a B. Why, why do we have a problem? This set here is computably enumerable. The, 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 the x down arrow y is not computably enumerable because it contains right the things that first appear in x at some point 
and definitely later appear in Y. Well, definitely later appearing in Y means does the, does the machine whose domain is Y ever converge on this? So there's a holding problem in, in, in between this one being uh, 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 decidable. But this one is very easy. Uh, here, you, you, you on some input, you wait until the machine for X converges. If it does, then you run the machine for y the same number of steps. If it converged, then uh, it's not in there. If it didn't converge yet, then you're in here. So this is a, this is a really nice CE set. And, and by the same argument that we saw here, that this difference between we and b bar needs to be infinite, because otherwise b bar is a CE set, which it can't be, because it's not computable. Uh, here, b bar also can't be, com can't be uh, computably enumerable still, so this set can't be finite because if it's finite, then it differs by a finite set from a computably enumerable set, and therefore it's computably enumerable. Uh, then p bar c e contradiction. Uh, and now that we have that. Uh, we get something slightly better by the same argument. All right. If I have a CE set, then any set which differs from the CE set by a computable set, right, by, by taking away a computable set, is still CE. Did I say that right? A CE set minus a computable set is CE. Because you start, enumer you start running the Turing machine, if it ever holds, then you check your computable property, and the computable property is it yes or no, and depending on that, you, you, you either keep holding or you go into an infinite loop. Uh, so that says this set is not just the infinite, it is not computable, because otherwise this not computably enumerable set would be a CE set minus some computable part. Therefore, this part also can't be computable. Yeah, go up those stairs right there. So we have an infinite non-computable set of things which first go into WE and then into B. directions last week <laughs> might have been useful. Everybody happy with it? I think I said something wrong a moment ago. I, I, I said, uh, this is not CE. None of you objected, but, but I'm now objecting to myself. I, I did say that, right? But, but to check whether you're in here, you start running the computation for x. If it never converges, you're not in there. If it does converge, then you start running the computation for y. Uh, if, you, if you converge in fewer steps than you did for the computation in x, you're not in here. If you don't converge in that many steps, then you just keep running. If you never hold, you're not in here. If at some point you do hold, uh, then you are in here. Right? The, being in x down arrow y means both the Turing machine related to x and the Turing machine related to y hold on this input. The computation for y takes more steps. Uh, that's uh, a, a CE uh, property. Okay, so with that, we should be ready to actually prove, finish the proof for Friedberg's fitting theorem. Uh, I'll, I'll remind you what we were, uh, what it's all saying. <coughs> so what did we have? We had B, C, E, not computable. 
uh, then right, if we have a set which is computably enumerable but not computable, then you can split it into two parts which are also computably enumerable and not computable. Uh, so then there exists A0, A1 computably enumerable such that uh, B is equal to A not union A1 and uh, A not and A1 are not computable um, and um, they're disjoint. That's all, right? B can be split into two sets of the same property. And, and we had decided most of we had decided most of the proof, right? We uh, introduced we had introduced this notation of a nice approximation for B. Uh, B is C E. Uh, it's certainly infinite. Therefore, there exists this uh, total computable one-to-one -one enumeration function, which enumerates it. BS is the S approximation to B, according to this enumeration. Uh, we had our requirements R E I, which says that W E is not equal to uh, A I complement. And, and we had observed that uh, by just doing reasonable things, we can satisfy all requirements uh, except maybe the REI. And all the requirements, this jointness, just don't be silly and put something in both A, A not and A1. Uh, making them CE, going along, chugging, doing computable stuff, while doing the computable stuff, every now and then you say put this in A not, uh, and then at some other point you say put this in A1, and, and, and this way you go along. You, you want to say, for every element in B, whether it goes into A0 or A1, and so at stage S, you take the S element of B, and you put it in either A0 or A1. Um, and, and so these ideas take care of everything except for item 2, and for item 2, exactly these requirements were uh, set up. And then um, we said, okay, um, we start at stage zero by putting F zero into A naught uh, and at stage S plus one what do we do? Well we look for the least pair EI such that according to some computable criterion R E I is not yet satisfied, which was to say F S plus 1, right? At, at stage S, we were going to take care of FS, so, so I'm going to do something with FS, or stage S plus 1, so FS plus 1. Uh, I check whether or not it is in WES, and whether it is the case that it currently looks like uh, WES could be an approximation for the complement of AI, right? WES intersect AIS being empty is to say, uh, according to the current approximations, it could be the case that WE enumerates the complement of AI. And, and so with this whole thing, this is all computable, but what it says is, in a computable way, the currently enumerated element of B is one in WE, and it looks like WE could be the complement of AI. Well, if you see these things together, and you know you're aiming to make WE not the complement of AI, the right thing to do is to take FS plus 1 and stick it in AI. Which is exactly what we do at this stage. Uh, then enumerate uh, FS plus 1 into AI. Uh, if there is no such least EI uh, where this computable property is satisfied, stick a best plus one wherever you like it, make a standard choice, like go oh, stick it in A not or something. Uh, who cares? Okay, and, 
and so this strategy clearly satisfies all the, all the things we wanted to do that satisfy everything other than the UI, our UI. Uh, we do computable stuff while doing the computable stuff. Every now and then we say put this in A0, put that in A1. Uh, for every element in B, at some point we say put it in A0, put it in A1. Uh, so we get computably enumerable disjoint sets that union up to B just by the description. No work needs to be done. So now all we need to do is check that REI, all the REI are satisfied. And, and, and uh, the way we do that is by induction. Uh, so we say um, uh, let REI least not satisfied. If some of the REI are not satisfied, then there is at least one that is not satisfied. Well, if you have at least one that is not satisfied, that means exactly that uh, WE is equal to uh, AI complement, because that's, right, that, that's the requirement, how do they are equal. Um, uh, what does that mean? Well, that means W E uh, contains B complement. Yeah, because by construction A I is a subset of B. Therefore the complement of A I is greater or equal to the complement of B. So we have a W E that contains B complement. Oh, that's wonderful because we just had a theorem that uh, that has its, its, its uh, all the hypotheses of this theorem are now satisfied. B is computably enumerable, not computable. Uh, B complement is contained in W E. Therefore, according to this theorem, we get W E down arrow B is infinite. There are infinitely many elements that first appear in WE and then at some later stage appear in B. Bingo. Right? That's exactly what we want. But now we can argue through this carefully. Right? Because it, it, you, you might be tempted at this stage to say, well, as soon as this is non empty, we're done. Because then we have some element which first is in WE and then later goes in B. Unfortunately, that doesn't work because right, the, the, the REI, uh, in stage S plus 1, we said look at the least REI. Uh, and, and this choice for the least one is that, in, in some sense, we're giving uh, REI with, with lesser EI a higher priority than the later ones. Right? If there is a bunch of them not satisfied, we choose the least one that is not satisfied to work on. Uh, and, and that translates in, in some sense to the, the, the lesser EI corresponding to higher priority requirements. We care about those more than the other ones. Well, we don't really, we care about all of them. But it's like um, uh, an like animal farm, they're all created equally, but some are more equal than others, yes. <laughs> right, the smaller ones are more equal than the bigger ones. Um, uh, so, so that means that if this is finite, you're still not done because there's finitely many things which are of higher priority and, and, and it might be that whenever something appears in here, whenever you have this thing in B which appears, which already is in WE, there is a higher priority requirement which steals it away from you. But, uh, notice that these, that these requirements, each of these requirements acts only once. What does it mean, act only once? At, at most once is a requirement picked in this stage. Because as soon as it's picked, you enumerate an element of B into AI. And then this will never, never again will it be the case that WE and AI are disjoint. 
So each of the each of the requirements of higher priority than this one act only once. Oh. We have infinitely many times that there is a witness which first appears in WB and then in B. Right? So infinitely many times there is a stage S where this part of the requirement is satisfied. Therefore, if this were satisfied in the end, at some point we would find one of these witnesses which is not stolen away by higher priority requirement, and then we would enumerate it. Uh, and that's a contradiction with this being the least not satisfied. Because the least not satisfied, we have just argued that at some point during the construction we would have acted on it, and as soon as you act, it's satisfied. Uh, so, so this property gives plenty witnesses. I, I, I'm not going to try and actually write down the, the, the argument I just gave. All right. you need, but you need infinitely many here, otherwise the higher priority arguments might uh, steal all your witnesses away. I guess that then you could argue that, well, you need you can compute which bounds you need, and on this, in this case you don't need very big bounds, but uh, anyway. Infinite is good enough, and uh, infinite is what we have. The fact that it showed up in W E before it showed up in B was important because we had was that that's because we had this F. The yeah, because because if you look at this, th then uh, you look at the the S element in B, yeah. seeing if it has already appeared in W E. Right. Okay, that's what that's what this requirement is doing. It, it's not saying is this element of B in W E. No, is this element in B. Or has this element in B already appeared in yeah. W E? Uh, and, and we observed last time that, right? Uh, as soon as you read it like this, has this element in B already appeared in W E? It seems silly because uh, why would that happen? Uh, but but that's the only way to computably approximate non-satisfaction of R E I. That's, that's the problem. We need to talk about REI not being satisfied in a computable way. So we came up with this approximation, and this approximation definitely says something about the order of enumeration. It's kind of a nice, simple example of a lot of the things we're going to see later. All these ideas of doing computable stuff every now and then, throwing something in there, uh, having some requirements. Right? We have a, a lot of requirements here, but, but a lot of them, most of them we just take, take, took care of by the shape of our construction and then we isolated a bunch of them where we said, well, these really are going to sort of we're going to work on these while well, everything else is kind of automatically satisfied by just doing uh, reasonable things as we go along. Because you heard me say these things like these are the requirements, and in some sense, by looking at the least one, we have a priority order on them. And, 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 and when you heard priority, you might have remembered this is what we're going for, right? In the end, we want to talk about priority arguments. So, so this is a trivial priority argument. There's, there's 
nothing curious going on. Every every REI acts only once, and once it acts, it's satisfied. It's much more interesting when we get to the point of you look at the least one which is not satisfied. You do something, and and doing this undoes the work you've done for other requirements, uh, and then uh, you have some. If your work cut out to still show that in the end all the requirements are satisfied, and, and, and that's what priority arguments uh, allow you to do. Okay, so let me just then for finishing off uh, rush through a bunch of things which you mostly already know, but. Um, a little bit of notation. So, so we already defined Oracle machines, right? Oracle machines were just Turing machines that um, had a way of asking a question, is this number in this given set? Right? The Oracle is given, the Oracle is a set of natural numbers, and, and your Turing machines are somehow equipped with a way of asking the membership question of this set, either by having an extra tape containing the characteristic function, by having a, a whichever device you like, but that's what you want, a Turing machine with this additional um, uh, ability. Then, this is the notation, right? For, for these Turing machines with oracles, uh, we also had an enumeration of the programs, the program does not depend on the oracle, even though the computation does depend on the oracle, right? You ask a question, does this belong in, in the set A or not? Depending on yes or no, you can do different actions, but, but you have a, a fixed enumeration of all oracle programs, which just compute differently depending on the oracle given. Uh, and so this notation is the one, the ETH oracle machine using Oracle A on input X outputs Y. Uh, a related notion, right? Capital Phi, lowercase phi, phi of B, X. Uh, and I point out capital versus lowercase because we'll be in situations where we have more than one of these functionals lying around and then the same convention goes. The capital one is the functional, the lowercase one is the use, and, and the use of the oracle is uh, the largest oracle question that actually got asked in the computation. Right? So phi of uh, AEX is equal to U, says this computation here, it asks a bunch of oracle questions, uh, U is the biggest oracle question it ever asks. All the other oracle questions are less than or equal to U. Uh, and so this is saying that the, the only part of the oracle that you used is the initial segment of length U plus 1. Uh, and you didn't use all of it, but, but you, you certainly didn't use more than this. So see, that, that's, the, that's the point of this use function. And, and how we will use it quite a bit later on, that we, we need some way of denoting how much of the oracle got used. Uh, and we need this because in some cases we're going to secretly change the oracle while the machine is not looking. Well, if you secretly change the oracle above you, then the computations don't differ, don't start changing. Um, so by u we just mean the largest element of A that is... Right, I see. Okay, Pardon? the largest number. I, see. I, I, got it. Yeah. I was just wondering what the biggest question of the oracle was. And I oh, the, the, yeah, so, so, so this computation goes long every now and then. It asks, is K an A? Yeah. And, and the largest K that appears in such a, such a question is, is, is U. You always have to be careful. Uh, I'm pretty sure I got the exact definition from the book like this. But sometimes the U is defined to be U plus 1. Uh, and so you have to be careful when you restrict your oracle, do you restrict it to exactly u or do you restrict it to u plus one, but... Uh, what if it doesn't halt? What if it just keeps asking? Oh, it, it, this is only defined when, when it halts. Right. 
because otherwise it might certainly be on an infinite computation you might be well you might keep asking the same yeah. question but you might also ask arbitrarily large uh, kind of things so um, this is this is defined whenever this computation holds and then it's you if it doesn't hold then there is no use Um, the comma x notation is of course the obvious thing, uh, intuitively these computations as they are done with at most s steps of the Turing machine, in reality you come up with some definition of like the code of the computation is less than or equal to s or, or, or something like that. Um, uh, we, can, we, we can and do use the same notations uh, when we don't have a whole oracle, but only an initial segment of an oracle, so sigma is uh, a, a finite sequence of zeros and ones corresponding to an initial segment of, of the characteristic function of the oracle. Um, and, and we write this, if this oracle computation, it asks questions of its oracle, and it never asks a question which is too big. Right? Sigma is of limited length, it's a finite sequence of zeros and ones. If this thing asks a question which is too big, then this computation does not hold. Uh, it's not like it keeps on computing, but I would it, but right? so, yeah. an exception gets thrown. Uh, whatever. Uh, right? it, it only, this only holds if the, all the questions are contained in sigma, and then in the same way, of course, uh, we can talk about the actual use of this finite part uh, of say the code. Um, well, let me just finish with this definition. Uh, and that is what we call a functional total because there is there's a couple of obvious choices for it being total well without notation there isn't maybe but so total means for all choices of oracle it's a, it represents a total function so this is to say for all a uh, there exists a b such that for all x y of a x is equal to Bx. Right? Right. A function like this is total if for all given oracles it represents a total functional 